Welcome back. It's Lou Brown with another of my amazing 101 Street Smart Cash Flow Accelerators. I've been in this business over 40 years, buying, holding, and selling property, and I've learned a lot of valuable things. And one of the things I talked about in number 51 was the uh, use of profit centers and adding in profit centers into your agreement. Uh, because people are, number one, willing to pay them if you're willing to offer certain things. Now, number 52 is charge extra person fees, extra charges when people move in. Now, what this means is, let's say that somebody's applied for your property and there's two adults and two children. And then you find out later that there's additional people living in the property. Now, that only happens a lot. So, so I want you to be aware of that, uh, that in the agreement, we actually have built into our standard rental agreement, an amazing additional profit center for you that says, if you're going to move in additional people, then you're going to pay a hundred dollars per person. Now, another clause says it's, if you don't tell us about that, then it's retroactive to the beginning date of the agreement. So let's say we find out about these extra people a year into the agreement and they didn't tell us about, let's say that they've got two extra people in there. Well, that's 200 additional dollars per month that you could be collecting on these extra people that are producing additional wear and tear on your property. You should be paid for. They didn't tell you about them in the beginning. They weren't approved by you. You don't know these people and their income was not considered in approving this transaction. And so what we like to do is actually just build it into the agreement so that if they do tell us about it, then it begins to be $100 per person. If they don't tell us about them, it's retroactive to the beginning date of the agreement. What? To create compliance. That's what you're doing. You're creating compliance to your rental agreement because it's a very powerful document but if you don't use it for what it's designed for, you can put yourself in a position of hurt. In this series, I've been talking about when managing property and having the right agreement. And in that agreement can be certain things that definitely will put you in a position of success. And this one is charge pet fees. Listen, when people have animals, they love those animals, in some cases, more than they love their children. The animal comes to them, they wag their tail, they love that animal, the animal loves the person, and everything is so cool. And so people are willing to pay for these animals. Now imagine that when someone discloses on their application that they have animals, we will allow up to two. Now we're mainly focused in the single family business. We do have multifamilies. I've done many, many multifamilies in the past. And we definitely also want to attract people that want to stay. Many landlords prohibit any kind of pets. Well, what does that create? That creates an unhappy camper. Listen, human beings love to take care of other things, other beings on the planet. And human beings love to have pets. Again, something that's gonna love them back. And so when we charge for pet fees, people willingly pay it. And watch this one, it can also create a client that's gonna stay longer because they may have trouble other places that will accept pets. Well, we have no problem with it. We're wanting to set these people up on what we call our path to home ownership where they can end up purchasing that property or a different property from us in the future. So we're very excited about them bringing their pets. Now we limit it to two pets. We want to know what kind of pets they are. We definitely want to vet that pet. <laughs> uh, there's even petscreening.com that will uh, check out that pet and they can pay a fee for that. But we charge a pet fee of $500 per pet and we charge a monthly rent on that pet, anywhere from 15 to $25 per pet per month. Now that's an, oh, that's a great thing. Now there's certain language again, so this is where having the right agreement comes into play. 
Now that agreement is our standard rental agreement and that's in my volume two selling and holding and also in volume eight property management. I definitely encourage you to get that, read that agreement and you're going to find some amazing profit centers that are built in also protections for you in your business. Hey, I've been at this game over 40 years of buying, holding, and selling property. And I can tell you, it's very critical that you have the right paperwork and that paperwork can bring you a whole lot of additional cash flow on a monthly basis. Charge pet rent. Yeah, baby. So not only, and I've been talking about in this series of managing your properties and additional profit centers that you can earn, we've identified over 25 different profit centers or additional income you can earn over and above what your regular mortgage versus the rent is, that little profit right there. But this is over and above money that you can make in your great real estate business. And we've developed these over 40 years of being in this business. It is great because people don't resist you on these things. They love you. You're giving them an opportunity. One of the things that we do is we offer our path to home ownership program to our potential buyers. And it's so exciting because they're gearing towards ownership of a property. And we want them to treat that property like it was theirs. We want them to have pets if they want pets. Now we limit it to two and we want to know what kind of pets those are. And we definitely want to vet those pets. <laughs> we want to know that there's something that we're not going to be afraid of if we come over to visit them at their house. And there's probably a very good reason that we might be visiting them at their house. Inspection, for example, of how they're taking care of the property. And also, you know, are they changing their filters? And also we might have to stop by from time to time if they're not paying their payment on time. So, we don't be frightened away by the type of pet that's there, but we charge pet rent. Now that's anywhere from 15 to $25 per pet per month. And that's additional income to you on your business. So absolutely positively do that. Now that needs to be built into the agreement. We have a standard rental agreement loaded with profit centers and protection volume two selling and holding. It's located there as well as, volume eight property management how we deal with collecting our money you know when someone doesn't pay as agreed what happens is that you have to take them to court you have to create an eviction and unfortunately sometimes you have to actually set people out of your properties and when you get to court sometimes the judges want to take your money and give it to the resident and they do that in the form of late charges. So even though late charges may be a part of your contract, and in fact they are, uh, what the judges will often do is strike through the late charges and not give them to you in the judgment. Well, that's not too nice since after all, you're the one who didn't get paid. You're the one who had to resource other money to pay the payment on your property. You had to pay your property taxes. You had to pay your insurance. And obviously, the use of the funds coming from the resident is one of the things that we use to make that happen. Uh, so it was a kind of a flash of brilliance one day that I said, well, let's just not have any late charges. And instead, let's convert any amount of money on a daily basis that would be due because they haven't paid us to additional rent. And so now in the agreement that we have, and this is our standard rental agreement loaded with profit centers and protection. This is in my volume two selling and holding. This one is about the discounted rent. Now, years ago, I invented this idea and the thought was, hey, if we set the rent, at a certain amount, and then we mark it up, say $100 per month, then when they pay on time, they earn a discount down to the amount that we would actually like to collect. And if they don't pay on time, then what happens is they pay the higher rent. They didn't earn their discount. So it's an earned discount. And the way they earn their discount is agreeing to pay on time. And so when they pay on time, then they pay the lower amount of rent, which is actually the amount of rent 
that you would like to get for that property. And when they don't, realize that you're going to have to spend time, energy. You may have to even spend resources to collect that. It takes time. It takes money. And so, therefore, the markup, so to speak, in the collection is to pay you for that additional energy. Now, I want to emphasize that this is not a common occurrence. Only about 10% of your residents don't pay in any given month on time. And so as you are building your portfolio, and as I say, one property at a time, you're building up your cash flow, you're building up your retirement, you're building up your equities, uh, then recognize and realize that collections are part of our business. And it's important that you have certain incentives built into your agreements so that it incentivizes your resident, if they only have a certain amount of money, that they're going to pay you first because it makes sense to pay you first. And maybe they defer payments on someone else if they only have a limited amount of funds to work with. So this is one of the many, many different ways that we have been able to coordinate receiving our money timely ways that you can increase the amount of money that you're receiving on every property that you do. And one of the ways that we've discovered that we can do that is to deal with the appliances. You know, I discovered years ago that appliances were one of the biggest headaches you could ever have. It was amazing to me. I had a whole bunch of apartments and people you know, would have a tiny little refrigerator with a tiny little freezer. And if the refrigerator went out, they would say that they had lost $400 worth of meat <laughs> because the, the freezer went out and they lost $400 worth of valuable meat. I discovered that being in the appliance business was not a business I wanted to be in. And so years ago, I started just carving out and disappearing appliances. So now if the home had a dishwasher, it still has one. If it had a stove, it still has one. If it had a refrigerator, it still has one if they are there. But what we tell the resident is they're there as a convenience to you. They are not included in the rent. If anything goes wrong or bad with those, call an appliance expert and have them come Deal with that or go buy yourself a new one and have fun with that. But uh, we actually got out of the appliance business years ago. I'm so glad we did. It's, we purchase a new property and it doesn't have any one of those three. We do you typically put in a dishwasher, but then we'll leave out the stove and refrigerator and we'll let the resident buy new ones. Now, here's another thing that we've done. This is another profit center. I should probably put it on another one. But we will actually sell the appliances to the residents. We can talk more about that. So I hope you love the idea of not having to be in the appliance business. And in fact, we have a clause in my standard rental agreement that says no part of the rent applies to appliances. If they're there, they're there as convenience and they are welcome to have them repaired or call us and we will take them away. And that's the way that we handle appliances. One of the things I discovered over time was that when we connect with our residents, we want them to be responsible around what they're doing with our property. Most of your residents have a lot of different bills due on the first of the month. So I rolled that back and I said, what if we got paid out of the middle of the month check instead of the first of the month check? So I rolled it back to the 25th month. Now, I found out that there's about 13 different benefits from collecting the rent early before the first of the month. One of them is that everybody else is filing their dispossessories later after the first of the month. They usually wait five days before they file dispossessories. Well, think about this. If you're collecting on the 25th and your resident doesn't pay on time, then you're actually filing your dispossessories on the first of the month when nobody else is there. So it opens up the opportunity for you to be in court before everybody else is. It opens you up to the opportunity for the your paperwork doesn't get delivered as a notice of the dispossessory warrant, and it doesn't get served until later in the month. 
Now, they may not call them dispossessories in your area, but you get the idea. If it is not timely, then you're going to be pushed back. Sometimes it can take up to a month for them to serve that paperwork. Well, in the meantime, you haven't been paid already. Now you're not being paid again until you finally get to court. So we want to speed that process up as much as possible. And one of the ways we do that is to get paid on the 25th of the month. I hope this has been of value to you. Like I said, I've got 13 different reasons that that alone is valuable to you. More information, having been a landlord now for over 40 years, I know what it's like to buy and hold property and I know what it's like to do everything you can do to be able to collect your money and to be able to use your money. You know, one of the challenges I learned early on is that most states have security deposits and most landlords collect the security deposit. Well, one of the things you got to know about a security deposit is it's not your money. It is the resident's money. And that money, in many states, you have to put that into a separate bank account, and you have to hold it there. And in some states, you have to tell them what bank it's in, what the account number is, and in some states, you even have to pay interest on the money. You have to manage the account, but you have to pay the resident interest on the money while it's there. So I, I finally got a clue, and I said, this is just insane, and it makes absolutely no sense because, first of all, we can't use the money. Secondly, at a later date when the resident moves out, that's when we have to account for the money in addition to accounting for it on a monthly basis. They could be there five years. You still have to keep up with that money. And I realized that we could do things differently. So what we created is what we call a move-in fee. And this move-in fee is actually equivalent to a little bit more than one month's rent. And when we collect that, it's a fee and we can spend the money right away. And that was, an, uh, was a game changer for us. I did a lot of research online. I did a lot of research in various state laws and I discovered that it was perfectly acceptable to do that instead of a security deposit. And in fact, you can do both. So I created a standard rental agreement loaded with profit centers and protection, and ours allows for the move-in fee, and it also allows for a security deposit. Well, you can put zero in the security deposit field, and you can put the amount of money in the move-in fee. Now, it's fully explained as to what a move-in fee is and is used for. It explains that it is a non-refundable fee. It also explains that we will pay our residents upon proper notice when it's our world we we get a 60-day notice and what happens is when we get proper notice then we notify them of what they have to do in order to keep the clean slate with us when they move out so we give them a 20 item checklist now this is all available in my volume 8 property management system, volume eight property management. It's got my standard rental agreement and it's also got my move out inspection report and it's got a move out checklist of about 20 items that we send the letter to the resident. The letter's already written. It's on forms disk. You can easily send it out. Now what happens is that we are willing to pay the resident for some of these various things. For example, we'll pay for a clean stove. We'll pay for a clean refrigerator. We'll pay for clean carpets. We'll pay for painted walls, provided that you approve of the work that's done. And you're going to walk through when they tell you that they're ready to have it inspected. And you're going to put together a checklist of items, which, by the way, is in my volume eight property management. And one of the things I discovered is to build into your rental agreement rental increases. Now, what that means is that you're telling your resident in advance that the rent may increase by X percent annually. Uh, so what that means is that you now can, can prescribe in advance that the rent may go up, say, 10%. Uh, and then what that means is now we tell the resident at what we call the signing ceremony 
<laughs> this is when we meet and we go over that document. This is when we train them to be a good resident. This is when we tell them everything that they need to know about becoming a good resident and being a good resident in good standing with us. And one of the things we explain to them is so important that you pay your rent on time and you take good care of your property. And oh, by the way, annually there is an increase because there's typically an increase in property taxes and insurance. So we're going to review that and we're going to we're going to touch base with you about 60 days before your renewal just to see how things are going and to let you know how much your increase is going to be. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at increases in property taxes and insurance to discover exactly what the increase will be. However, we're also going to look at how much damage was done. How many times did we have to come out and make repairs to the property? Were those repairs aging or were those repairs actual damage that was done by a family member or even guests? So what we are looking at is the overall picture of how that resident is taking care of the property when we make our decision of how much to increase the rent. Now this may be subject to certain guidelines within your local community or your state. They may have limitations on the amount of increase you can do annually. And I can tell you that in most cases, we do not raise our rent more than 5%. However, in our agreement, we do have a blank line for the amount that you can increase the rent by. So we typically have in that blank line 10%, but we tell the resident it's not typically that much. Now this is available in my property management system. This property management system is available online uh, at streetsmartinvestor.com, streetsmartinvestor.com, and it is loaded with valuable things. Listen, if you are going to own property, you've got to become a professional property manager for of your own assets. And let me tell you something. When you can learn how to professionally and properly manage your property, you can save a fortune in fees because property managers do typically charge a pretty significant amount of your profitability, uh, a full month's rent to rent it up. They charge up to 10% on a monthly basis in collections. They charge other fees. They add on sometimes for repairs, for managing the repairs. They charge a half a month's re-up fee. I mean, there's all kinds of different fees that you're faced with when you hire professional property management. And that can be a significant sum of money, particularly if you're going to acquire a whole bunch of properties. So I suggest that you learn how to be a professional property manager and do this thing right. One of the things that we're focused on in this part of the series is property management, proper property management, informed property management. And one of the most important things you can do in property management is to have excellent documentation. And not only to have excellent documentation, but also to train your resident to be a good resident. So what we do is we have a signing ceremony. We, we call it the signing ceremony. And we invite the resident to come into our office. But if you don't have an office, set up a location. It could be a hotel lobby. It could be the local Waffle House, Denny's, wherever that you can have a quiet place. You can sit to be there for a while uh, in a comfortable environment, not at the empty house that you're going to rent to them or the apartment sitting on the floor. That's not comfortable for anybody. And it's not conducive for learning and for education because that's exactly what we use the signing ceremony for. We want our resident to be educated and trained to be a good resident. So we use that document, the standard rental agreement loaded with profit centers and protection and negotiation when we are sitting down with them to do the signing ceremony. Now we typically say, please get a babysitter for your kids. This is gonna be focused. We need everyone who is going to be a signatory on the agreement, which means everyone in the house is 18 years of age or older 
must appear at the signing ceremony, and then together we're going to go through the documents so you can fully understand what you're agreeing to. And then when they get to the signing ceremony, we have already got our documents done. They're very professionally done. The way our forms disk is laid out, I mean, it looks like an attorney prepared all of these documents. They're very consistent. They're concise. They match. They have a flow. There's a step-by-step -step process. I teach that to you. In fact, that's available to you in our property management. This is volume eight of our Street Smart system, and this is available at streetsmartinvestor.com. It comes with the forms disk and six hours of CDs that walk you through proper property management. And one of the things that we do at the signing ceremony is go through all the documentation with the resident, and literally we give them a copy, all complete, and we have a copy, and we together read that document. So literally we're reading them each thing. We're going over each paragraph so that there is no confusion, and they actually initial every page. They sign the document at the end. There is no confusion about who was present at the time at the meeting, and that's your opportunity to train your resident to be a good resident. There's a lot more to that conversation in Volume 8. One of the great things is that we discovered that when we are in the field, so to speak, when we're face to face with residents, you know, some people are going through a world of different drama, different situations within their life. And what happens is that sometimes they don't do what they agreed to do. And when that happens, sometimes they go bonkers. I, don't, I know you've heard the term going postal, right? And it's like the post office worker that works there for 30 years and has always been mild-mannered and never had any upset, but every day they were getting more and more like a powder keg, and then one day they just blow up and have random, let's just say, violence at the workplace. So we want to avoid any kind of violence, upsets, breakdowns, and one of the things we discovered is when you are the manager and you're not the owner, and you're not the one that has all of the answers, and you're not the one that can make all of the decisions, it's a far better place to be. It's similar to what you do at your job when you are just, let's say, putting forth a policy with a customer or another coworker, and you're saying, listen, I just work here. I'm just, don't kill the messenger, don't be upset. I'm just delivering to you uh, what we do. Now, one of the things that we've done all throughout our entire career is we've always gone back to the paperwork. What is it that was agreed to between the parties? So whenever you can keep the emotion out, keep the drama out, don't get in. Sometimes they're trying to pull you and do all they can do to get you into their world so that there can be an upset, there can be a fight, there can be backbiting, there can be negative talk between one another. Listen, always bring yourself above that. Always only refer back to what was agreed to. No other discussions. And one of the ways we found that, that works best is to not own the property. Now, this is an absolute truth. But we're not lying to anyone. In fact, one of the things that I teach you is to hold title to your property in trust. And so I became an expert years ago on these things called land trusts. And land trusts are phenomenal at being able to get the property out of your name and put the property into this thing called a trust. And listen, there's about 30 different trusts out there. Land trusts have their own unique properties and their own unique requirements and benefits as well. About 30 different benefits that you can get from land trusts you cannot get from any other entity. So what I have you do is transfer your property that's maybe in your name or in an LLC's name, have you transfer that to a trust 
and then there's a letter in the land trust system where you send that to the resident and say, I no longer own the property. However, I'm going to remain on as the manager for an indefinite period of time. The new owners have some new paperwork they want me to go over with you. That's how you can get out of potentially an agreement that you currently have in place because now there's a new owner and the new owner wants new paperwork. You go over your new standard rental agreement that you learned about that's provided by Volume 8, and then you can realize that there is a way that you can truthfully and with confidence say to the resident that you are not the owner, you are the manager of the property. Why? Because there is a management agreement that the trustee of the trust hires you to be the manager. And so, therefore, the truth is you do not own the property. The truth is the trust owns the property. The trust hires you to manage the property, and you're the one that that uh, advertises the property. You're the one that manages the property. You're the one that collects the rent. You're the one that deposits the rent. You're the one that hires people to do work on the property. And you keep yourself out of the line of fire, so to speak. One of the things that I've discovered in being in this business is that you have to put yourself in a position to win. And the way that you do that is that you take yourself again out of the position of receiving anything at your home. One of the things over time I'm going to teach you is that it's very important that you create some privacy for yourself. Your residents should not know where you live. Your contractors should not know where you live. Anybody, I mean, we all know people are getting crazy now, and it's just a better idea to put yourself in a position that you don't, all your business is not in the street, so to speak. It's a much better idea to get an office. Now, this office is about this long and about this big, and what I'm talking about is a mailing address at your local UPS store or other pack mail, whatever may be common in your area, and that becomes the address that all bills are sent to, that your property tax reports are sent to, that uh, your residents send their rent to. I recommend that you get your mail, your address off of public record. Now, one of the things I referred to in another video is to take your name off public record and transfer your property, your own residence, into trust. Now, trusts have about 30 different benefits, and one of them is probate avoidance when you've already got the property in trust. Another is privacy, so that you are not on public record as the current owner of the property. The trust is the owner of the property. You may be a beneficiary of that trust, but that is not published out in the public. And so that's something that I want you to learn about. It's very critical and important that you set up a good solid estate plan. And part of the process is to notify your residents that you no longer own the property because it's now in trust and that uh, you are now the manager of the property and the new owners want the rent mailed to this new address. And so setting up that address also, again, helps you to transfer that burden of ownership to the trust and take it off of your shoulders. This one focuses on managing your property. I've been buying, holding, and selling property now for over 40 years, love the business, and one of the things that we do is always teach you how to have effective property management, efficient property management, and profitable property management. And this one is raise rents annually. You know, one of the big mistakes that landlords make is that they don't raise rents. They get very confident and comfortable in their relationship with their resident and they don't want them to move. I don't blame you for that. I'd want to feel the same way. However, what happens is inflation is a real thing. Check with the Bureau of Labor Statistics and you'll find that Inflation over the last 20 years has been about 2.94% per 
year. So in other words, you start a year in January with a dollar, you end a year in December 31st with about 97 cents. So you already know you're going backwards by 3% and doesn't it make sense to raise your rents? Now in our standard rental agreement that I've talked to you about on other segments, one of the things that we've built in is an annual increase in rents built in that it's 10%. Now we tell our resident when we do our signing ceremony that I also covered in different segments, we tell them that it does say 10%. However, we're gonna look at the different uh, expenses that we've had on the property to determine what the amount will be. For the purposes of this training, it's to share with you that you should always raise your rent at least 3% just to be even with the beginning of the year and to also take into consideration property taxes, insurance, and repairs that you've had to the property. And when you use my paperwork, standard rental agreement, it already has a place built in for you to notify your resident that the rent will go up in 12 months. I hope this has been valuable to you like it, love it, share it, and subscribe to our channel. And I look forward to seeing you soon at my Millionaire Jumpstart training. If you'd like to know more about managing properties the right way, the Street Smart way, go to streetsmartinvestor.com. Look at the tools and you'll find my property management system, volume eight. Call us 1-800-578-8580. Have a great day. Yeah, baby.